You got to love the dot plot. It just always creates controversy and everybody's trying to figure out exactly where everybody is on that. Powell made a great point. It's two separate events. So he made, he made the markets convince them that don't equate the two. Taper is one thing. And if the economy is healthy, then he can take his foot off the gas pedal. And, and obviously the markets love that. My goodness, everything went green when he announced that. But it's really the, the rate increase. And I thought it was interesting, the dot plot, you know, is pointing to 2.5% on Fed funds out there at some point. Um, and people are going to have to pay attention to that. There's so much uncertainty about the economy. And I think there is confusion. And keep in mind, it was pointed out by CNBC that over uh, half of the FOMC is going to turn over by December. So we're going to have a new, yep. at least yep. a new majority by the middle of next year. That's so important. The voting members, they, they roll over every year. And so a lot of the people that are out on the tape making comments every day, well, their comments may matter, but their vote won't next year and vice versa. If you were a, a betting man, and you kind of are with a couple hundred billion dollars, Chris, do we get a rate hike in 2022? It's tough to say exactly. I would lean toward yes, because, you know, with rates at zero, we need to have what we call normal interest rates again. It, it tends to put too much emphasis on risk assets. Brian, we went through this after in, in 2010, 11, 12, when the big question was, let's get back to normal rates, get, get the Fed some ammo. So I hope we would, but it's going to depend on the economy and this strange unemployment situation where you have lots of unemployed and lots of employment opportunities and the two are not meeting. So I don't know how that plays out. And I, I'm not going to predict the, the, the COVID virus. Who knows if we're still talking about that a year from now? Yeah, I mean, let's hope not. And, and by the way, to your point, there are more open jobs in America, 10.8 million, I think, than there are people looking for work. It's a really remarkable time in, in American and human history. Let's go back to the other thing, the taper and the rate hikes, because the way I've described it to my teenager, Chris, and it may not be the exact right analogy, I said, on one hand, you've got a bunch of credit card debt and the taper is sort of paying off that debt. Then you've got, you're worried about the, the rate on that debt going up. It's not perfectly analogous, <laughs> but that's sort of the way I described it. What is more important to you, to your investments, and to maybe even our audience with just, you know, th their retirement portfolio, the reduction of bond buying or the raise of interest rates? What will move the ship more? I'm going to confuse your audience by saying if you're retired and you're living on a fixed income, it's inflation. Watch that inflation statistic. Um, it probably is uh, uh, seeing them slow down on those that credit card because that really is and paying it off. That really is building a Fed balance sheet that has to be unwound at some point. It implies the economy is doing OK. When they start playing with interest rates, then they're talking about inflation which is really the big fear for retirees. Uh, and so for us, and I noticed in the comments, uh, he didn't say transitory inflation. So maybe they're starting to realize there's some stickiness to this inflation risk. Uh, and while they're happy right now, I think that's going to be a big story in 2022 that we're all going to have to watch. These, these shortages of parts and supplies are invasive across yeah. the economy. Yeah. I mean, the Fed can say transitory, but no CEO that comes on CNBC, I don't think, has used that term, at least if they can't get supplies, they can't get parts as well. Um, speaking of inflation, Chris, we've got our Delivering Alpha conference coming up, by the way, plug, next Wednesday, virtual. You can still sign up. Go to CNBC.com. I'm hosting a panel on credit and inflation. And uh, when you look at credit, owning debt like you do, What's the opportunity going to be? Because inflation just kills interest income. So what's going to be the outlook for the next 10 years? And is it like you just have to own stocks because credit is, is sort of DOA in many ways? Well, and, and that's a good panel to listen to because you're going to have Elizabeth Burton, the CIO from Hawaii, a strong up-and-comer in our industry, very opinionated lady. And I think she's going to be insightful on the fact that credit spreads are way too tight. Uh, you know, uh, they're inside a hundred. Um, and so it's investment grade debt just isn't very attractive at these levels. So a lot of it, if you factored in inflation, a lot of it's at negative yields. So uh, you're seeing people buy private credit uh, because it's variable rate. And so they can rise back up with it. 
Um, and, and people are really reducing their fixed income exposures overall. Uh, so the, the opportunities in high yield are, are far and few between. Uh, and there's concern in the credit markets that, that just was spreads this tight. It's just not worth the risk. You know, and I apologize for reading. I'm looking at your benchmarks and sort of what you have to own as far as asset classes. You're at uh, 48% public equities, stocks, in other words, but about 11%, just under 11% in fixed income. I mean, you 11% of your money is a huge sum of money. Is it hard to find stuff to buy? You know, right now it's not because uh, it's fairly listed with, with U.S. governments and agencies and then a little bit of high yield. But it's really interesting is that number of 11% is way down from where it used to be. I can go back, obviously, you know, I've been in this business a long time, to the 80s where it was 40% of our portfolio. So it shows we've reduced that exposure to fixed income as interest rates have come down for 35 years. We're now near the bottom. And so you're seeing people like us create a portfolio that's more diversified with not just traditional fixed yeah. income in the index, yeah. but private credit, uh, asset-backed securities, other types of securities that we think gives us variable rates and the opportunity to climb when rates finally turn and head back up. Okay, and finally, I'll wrap it up with this. I know you're not an individual stock picker, but you have a massive portfolio. I just noticed that you have been reducing your holdings in big tech, Apple, <clears throat> the biggest one, by the way, coming down. Is that because you think that the run for big tech is done, or is that simply because they've gone up so much it messed with your benchmarks and you kind of had to sell even though you still like the space? You know, it really, it's a little bit of our active managers because we do have, while we're 70% passive, we do have some active managers, but it's also rebalancing within our portfolio to make sure we have proper exposure to mid cap and small cap. Uh, so when you look at those deciles of the market, you're absolutely right. Big tech and the narrow names in big tech have run so much they've been overweight relative to other opportunities. So it's just a matter of us rebalancing our portfolio and keeping us exposed with reasonable exposures into what we think are other opportunities. Chris Aylman of Calsters. Chris, it's really always a pleasure to have you on the program and the network, and especially after the Fed.